Okay, so we are looking at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, part two of the article, Did a Historical Jesus Exist? by Jim Walker, originally published June 12, 1997. And I will backtrack about two sentences to uh, bring, bring whoever's listening, if anyone, up to speed. Of Mark's 666 verses, some 600 appear in Matthew, some 300 in Luke. According to Ranel, Randall Helms, the author of Mark, whoever he was, stands at least at a third removed from Jesus and more likely at the fourth remove. The author of Matthew had obviously gotten his information from Mark's gospel and used them for his own needs. He fashioned his narrative to appeal to Jewish tradition and scripture. He improved the grammar of Mark's gospel, corrected what he felt was theologically important, and heightened the miracles and magic. The author of Luke admits to being an interpreter of earlier material and not an eyewitness. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Many scholars think the author of Luke was a Gentile, or at the very least, a Hellenized Jew, and even possibly a woman. He or she wrote at a time of tension in the Roman Empire and with its fever of persecution. Many modern scholars think that the Gospel of Luke was derived from the Mark Gospel and a hypothetical document called Q. John, the last appearing Bible Gospel, presents us with long theological discourses from Jesus and could not possibly have come as literal words from a historical Jesus. The Gospel of John disagrees with events described in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Moreover, the book was written in Greek near the end of the first century, and according to Bishop Shelby Spong, the book carried within it a very obvious reference to the death of John Zebedee, John 21, 23. Page, okay. Some scholars feel that the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John may have derived in part out of an earlier work designated as Q, German Quelli, which means source. However, since we have no manu manuscript from Q, no one could possibly determine who its author was or where or how he got his information or the date of its authorship. Again, we're faced with unreliable methodology and obscure sources. It's important to realize that the stories themselves cannot serve as examples of eyewitness accounts since they were products of the minds of the unknown authors and not from the characters themselves. The Gospels describe narrative stories written almost virtually in the third person. People who wish to portray themselves as eyewitnesses will write in the first person, not the third person. Moreover, many of the passage, passages attributed to Jesus could only have come from the invention of its authors. For example, many of the statements of Jesus are said to have come from him when he is allegedly alone. If so, who heard him? It becomes even more marked when the evangelists report about what Jesus thought. To whom did Jesus confide his thoughts? Clearly the Gospels employed techniques that fictional writers use. In any case, the Gospels can only serve at best as hearsay, and at worst as fictional or myth mythological stories. Other New Testament writings. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> epistles of John, excuse me, Epistles of Paul. Paul's biblical letters, epistles, are the oldest surviving Christian texts. I'm sorry, I just lost my place. Written probably before 60 CE. We have little reason to doubt that Paul wrote them himself. However, there occurs not a single 
instance in all of Paul's writings that he ever meets or sees an earthly Jesus. Therefore, all accounts about a Jesus could only have come from other believers. Hearsay. Epistles of John. The epistles of John and the Gospels of John and Revelations appear so different in style and content that they could hardly have been written by the same person. Some suggest that these writings of John are the work of a group of scholars in Asia Minor who followed a John, or they were the work of church fathers who aimed to further the interests of the church. Or they could have simply come from people also named John, a very common name. No one knows. Also note that nowhere in the body of the three epistles of John does it mention a John. In any case, the epistles of John say nothing about seeing an earthly Jesus. Not only do we not know who wrote the epistles, they could only serve as hearsay accounts of Jesus. Epistles of Peter Many scholars question the authorship of Peter of the epistles. Even within the first epistle, it says in 5.12 that it was written by Silvanus. As for the second epistle, doubt about its authenticity occur as early as the time of Origen. <laughs> 217 through 251 CE. In short, we have no way of determining whether the epistles of Peter come from fraud, an unknown author also named Peter, a common name, or from someone trying to further the aims of the church. Lying for the church. The editing and formation of the Bible was done by members of the Orthodox Church. Since the fathers of the church owned and determined what would appear in the Bible, there existed plenty of opportunity to change, modify, or create texts that might bolster the position of the church or the members of the church themselves. Take, for example, and I cannot pronounce this word, <laughs> uh, E-U-S-E-B-I-U-S, -E who was an ecclesiastical church historian and bishop. He had great influence in the early church, and he openly advocated the use of fraud and deception in furthering the interests of the church. Many scholars think that Eusebius, <laughs> Eusebius, Eusebius forged Josephus' writings where he mentions Jesus. Sorry, I can't pronounce some of these words, okay? All right. The church had such power over people that to question the church would result, could result in death. Regardless of what the church said, people had to take it as truth. <laughs> St. Ignatius Lo <laughs> Loyola, <laughs> oh Lord, Sir Ignatius Loyola of the 16th century even wrote, we should always be disposed to believe that which appears to us to be white is really black, if the hierarchy of the church so decides. The Orthodox Church also fought against competing Christian cults. <laughs> Urena oh God, this name. Uranius. <laughs> I'm saying this wrong too. I R E N. Irenaeus. Irenaeus. Okay who determined the four Gospels, wrote his famous book, Against the Heresies. This book helped fuel the fire for later inquisitions. Also by, saying that, also, by saying what Christianity was not, he and others like him became the very definition of the Orthodox faith. The early Christian, shit, sorry, the early church burned many heretics, along with their sacred texts. If a Jesus did exist, perhaps his writings or writings from an eyewitness may have been burnt with them. We will never know. With such intrans... <laughs> I, you know what? It's been a, a long day and I'm tired and these are really freaking big words, some of them. Okay. With such intransigence from the church and the admitting to lying for its cause and burning of her heretical texts... 
How could any honest scholar take any book from the New Testament as absolute, much less use extraneous texts that support a church's position as reliable evidence? In an attempt to salvage the Bible, the respected revisionist and scholar Bruce Metzer has written extensively on the problems of the New Testament. In his book, The Text of the New Testament, Its Transmission, Corruption, and Restoration, Metzer addresses errors arising from faulty eyesight, errors arising from faulty hearing, errors of the mind, errors of judgment, cleaning up historical and geographical difficulties, and alterations made because of doctrinal considerations. The Gnostic Gospels. In 1945, an Arab made an astonishing archaeology discovery in Upper Egypt, Egypt of several ancient papyrus, I can't say this word either, P-A-P-Y-R-U-S books. <laughs> they have since been referred to as the Nag Hammadi texts. They contained 52 heretical books written in Coptic script, which include Gospels of Thomas, Philip, James, John, Thomas, oh, and many others. These books have been dated at around 350 through 400 CE. They represent copies from previous copies. None of the original texts exist, and scholars argue about a possible date of the originals. Some of them think that they can hardly be later than 120 through 150 CE. Others have put it closer to 140 CE. Since these texts and their originals could only have been written well after the alleged life of Jesus, they cannot serve as historical evidence of Jesus any more than the Orthodox versions. Again, we have only heretical hearsay. Non-Christian Sources Virtually all other claims of Jesus come from sources outside of, Christian, outside of Christian writings. Devastating to the claims of Christians, however, comes from the fact that all of these accounts come from authors who lived after the alleged life of Jesus. Since they did not exist at the time of the supposed Jesus, None of their accounts serve as eyewitness evidence. Josephus Flavius, the Jewish historian, was the earliest non-Christian mention of Jesus. Although many scholars think that Josephus' short accounts of Jesus in the Antiquities came from interpolar interpolations perpetuated by a later church father, Josephus was born in 37 CE, after the alleged crucifixion of Jesus. Therefore, even if his accounts about Jesus, Jesus came from his hand, his information could only have come from hearsay accounts. Pliny the Younger, a Roman official, was born in 62 CE. His letter about the Christians only shows that he got his information from Christian believers themselves. Regardless, his birthday puts him out of the range of eyewitness accounts. Tacitus, the Roman historian, was born in 64 CE, well after the alleged life of Jesus. He gives a brief mention of a Christus in his annuals book, I don't know this, it's Roman number, XV, <laughs> section 44. However, he gives no source for his material. Although there were many disputes as to the authenticity of Tactius, mention of Jesus, the very fact that he was born after Jesus could, could only provide us with hearsay accounts. I'm sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> My arm is going to sleep from holding this camera, and I'm tired, and I'm saying all these words really wrong, and there's a lot more of them. I'm looking down the page. There's a lot more of them that are... <clears throat> going to be hard for me to pronounce. And I said Roman, not... Well, okay, yeah, Roman numerals. Whoever thought we would... I never did know my Roman numerals. Actually, I did at one point. Okay, end of commercial break. Another name I can't pronounce. <laughs> Suetonius, a Roman historian born in 69 CE, who mentions a Crestus, 
a common name. Apologists assume that Christus means Christ, but even if Suetonius had used Christ, it still says nothing about an earthly Jesus. Just like all the others, Suetonius was born after the purported Jesus. Again, only hearsay. Talmud. Amazingly, some Christians use brief portions of the Talmud, a collection of Jewish civil and religious law, including commentaries of, on the Torah, as evidence for Jesus. They claim that Yeshu, a common name in Jesus, li God, a common name in Jewish literature, in the Talmud stands for Jesus. Regardless how one interprets this, the Palestinian Talmud was written between the 3rd and 5th century CE and the Babylonian Talmud between the 3rd and 6th century CE, at least two centuries after the alleged crucifixion. At best, it can only serve as controversial Christian and pagan legend. It cannot possibly serve as evidence for a historical Jesus. As you can see, apologist Christians are embarrassing themselves when they unwittingly or deceptively violate the rules of historio historiography by using after the events writings as evidence for the event itself. Not one of these writers ever gives a source or backups or backs up his claims with evidential material about Jesus. Although we can provide numerous reasons why the non-Christian sources are spurious and argue endlessly about them, we can cut to the chase by simply looking up their author's dates. It doesn't matter what these people wrote about Jesus. An author who writes after the alleged happening and gives no detectable source for his material can only give examples of hearsay. All the post-writings about Jesus could easily have come from the beliefs and stories from Christian believers themselves. Okay, well that's me stumbling through after working two jobs, and I'm tired. Um, you know, if you really, if you really want to get this article, uh, or if you, if you want, blah, now I can't even talk. Um, for this article to really <laughs> read it yourself, you know, did a historical of Jesus exist. Go to Google and type that in and you will get down the page the article by Jim Walker and you can read it yourself and not have to deal with the constant bombardment of mispronunciations <laughs> by a clueless person who's tired. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, it's bad enough these words that I hardly ever use in my natural dialogue, but then we've got these, these names that are so... yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'm going to end this. Um, this is part two. I will continue to read, and hopefully tomorrow I will do better than I did tonight. And I, again, apologize for all the stumbles. Thanks for listening if you have. Bye-bye.